All right, let's get started. So bootstrapping recommendations with Neo4j. Um, as Greg mentioned, my name is Max Demarzi. I'm a field engineer for Neo4j. I blog about uh, Neo4j use cases and things you can do with Neo. So please go to maxdemarzi.com to see some of that content. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at maxdemarzi or email me. And there's also something like 200 uh, sample re uh, repositories on GitHub with Neo4j projects you can uh, grab and take a look at um, and use. All right, so um, the world has been collecting all this data. You know, we have this nickname for it, the big data. And what is it good for? Um, usually absolutely nothing unless you have a plan of what to do with it. Um, but what we have seen people do with it is benchmarking, and that is trying to figure out which things perform better and why. That's kind of a, the last part is the, the hard question to answer. Um, also recommendations, that is, the idea that a current user should buy this thing right now. And lastly, predictions, and that is taking a look at your user base and, and seeing what do we think they're going to do. Um, looking at users and saying, you will probably buy this thing. So today we're going to talk about the thing in the middle, recommendations, and what um, you can use uh, to build your recommendation engine uh, with neo 4 so let's start with the basic example. That is something like a top 10. This is the, the most popular um, items in a category. So this is a very naive approach. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Right? This may work uh, for your use case. Let's take a look at the naive approach for Amazon. If you were to go to Amazon, I guess this is a couple of weeks ago, and look for the best sellers in toys and games, you'd end up with a list that looks like this. Now, if you are going to buy your kids uh, Cards Against Humanity, you'd be doing them a terrible disservice. Um, but that's the kind of thing that happens when you just rely on top 10 as a, as a way to recommend products to users. Uh, it doesn't always work. And the sad thing is this is Amazon.com doing this. Uh, so they're failing at recommendations, um, at least in this case. So let's look at different ways to do recommendations. One of them is content-based. <coughs> and the idea here is we're going to take a three-step process. First step, we're going to look at the item characteristics. We're going to find items that are similar, and then we'll recommend similar items. And the example here is movie genres, right? So if you've just watched a movie like Ah Zombies, which is a romantic zombie comedy for teens, then you may like Warm Bodies, which is exactly the same thing. It's a romantic zombie comedy for teens. Um, the only problem with this, though, is that there's more to life than just these types of movies. And you have to kind of break out of that and say, hey, you watch these things. Let's watch something different or something else that you may like, even though it has very different characteristics as these movies. You also have collaborative filtering type recommendations, where you collect user behavior, you find users that are doing the same kind of thing, um, and then you recommend behavior taken by these similar people. Okay, so the example I can give here is people with similar musical tastes. The problem with this, though, is that you end up with um, a list of recommendations that is very simple, that's very one-sided, and then you keep recommending the same type of thing over and over again. So you end up with these clones of people uh, that all look the same, act the same, wear the same clothes, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense because people are more, have more dimensions uh, than just one. So... Usually what people do is they combine them together. They make hybrid recommendations. And so we're going to take the content-based filtering, and we're going to take the collaborative filtering, and we're going to kind of squish them together and try to make some use of it. So the reason we do this is because we get better results, obviously. Um, most recommendation systems in the wild are not very simple. They're, they're, they're a combination of multiple things. Sometimes they'll have completely different types of recommendations running and then scoring them, and at the end, uh, you know, using those scores and some weights to finally give the user the actual recommendation with a little bit of fuzziness here and there and some A-B testing. Uh, but we're going to try to build a combination recommendation engine in Neo4j for our first go. Um, the reason we want to do this in Neo versus doing it in something else is because we want it to be real-time. So you can build recommendations on any system. Uh, the, the reason you want to do it real-time is because you have the user's eyeballs right then and there. Um, you have some new piece of data. For example, LinkedIn, if someone just changed jobs, you don't want to 
recommendation based on yesterday's view of the world. We want to give them a recommendation based on their new view of the world, so the new um, co-workers, new type of uh, information. You know, if you just watch this movie, you want to give them a recommendation from yesterday where um, it, it recommended that movie that they just saw already. That makes no sense. So we're trying to find you know, um, real-time examples of what we want now. And the challenges, obviously, is the lots of data to process, lots of relationships to connect. Um, and we have to be mindful of these changes coming in all the time. Uh, but hopefully, you know, things become more relevant the more we learn about our users. A lot of our customers nowadays are building what they call Customer 360 um, data stores of, of, our of their customers so they can understand them um, from many angles and try to build recommendations based on everything that they know about them. Um, so just so that we're all on the same page, in case you've never seen this before, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between relational and the graph model. So in the relational model, everything is connected in these tables, and you have joint tables connecting things together. For example, if you were to model uh, people rating movies, you could have a movie table, a person's table, and then this giant ratings table that would grow and grow and grow as people rated movies. And when you try to join on that ratings table, you'd have a very hard time uh, as your user base and your, and your ratings grow. In the graph model, we don't do that. Instead, we have nodes and relationships where we have a single user node, and we'll see what ratings uh, he gave to those movies, uh, and that doesn't grow, right? A user may have watched 100 movies, 200 movies, and, and rated a few of them, but it doesn't matter how many total users you have. It doesn't matter how many total movies you have or ratings you have. All that really matters is how many that particular user has rated, and that's kind of the difference between uh, the relation on the graph model. And we also have this nice query language called Cypher in order to... Um, ask questions of the graph, uh, find patterns in the graph. So in this case here, we're looking at a person who happens to have a name of Dan, who knows another person who happens to have a name of Ann. And we're matching this pattern in the graph in order to get the results that we're looking for. So let's um, understand the reason for Cypher is when you're trying to describe a pattern or a, a graphy um, query in your data set, it's a lot easier to do it with this language than with the old SQL language. SQL language is a bit of a mess when you're trying to do uh, multiple layers, multiple paths. Those kind of interesting queries are just, you get lost in them. This is a query, uh, it's a lot more condensed format for them. All right, so let's build this Hello World recommendation. We have just watched Toy Story, and we, we loved it, thought it was great, and we want to be recommended something like A Bug's Life. Similar idea, similar type of uh, theme. That makes a lot of sense. But if we watch A Bug's Life, what we don't want is to be recommended uh, The Human Centipede. Right? That would be a horrible recommendation for a movie to watch with your kids, even though they're about similar things. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to have a data model that has people. Right? These are the users in our system. We have these movies that have titles and they have genres. So a movie could be comedy, could be an action, it could be a cartoon, a combination of those things. right? Usually, your movies don't have just a single genre. They have multiple. And then our people are going to rate these movies, and they're going to give them a score from 1 to 10. Right? So the 10, if they loved it, or 1, if they hated it, or just if they haven't seen it, they would just not rate it at all. And that's all we're going to need in order to build this. So this is our movie recommendation. What are the top 25 movies that a user has not seen with the same genres as Toy Story? that were given high ratings by people who like Toy Story. So the same genres and, and the high ratings by people who like Toy Story are our combination. So we look at this query. It's kind of um, color-coded. You can actually start at the bottom, and maybe it'll make a little bit more sense, right? So we have, we're looking for top 25, so if we have a limit of 25. We're going to rate them by the number of times we see them being recommended, so that's our count in descending order where the user has not seen them yet. So here's, I'm the user, Max Marzi, and I have not rated or watched this unseen movie. And there's a not relationship, uh, not in our pattern, telling us that we don't want this thing to exist. Where the genres are the same, so the watched movie and the unseen movie is the same. And the watched movie in this case is uh, Toy Story. Uh, where the ratings were high, so I gave it 8, 9, or 10 for Toy Story. And the unseen movie was also given 8, 9, or 10 by people who like both of them. 
And that's how we can combine both the genres, so some characteristics of the movie we know, plus the user ratings in order to make all this work. And it's, you know, with a seven lines of code, and you have a, a very simple hybrid recommendation engine that could work, and it would be, you know, just as simple as that. Cyber doesn't have to be complicated in order to be effective. You just need the right uh, pattern and right description in order to make it all work. So this is a little easy. Let's try making this a little bit harder, just for kicks. So let's look at a K nearest neighbor type recommendation. And for this KNN, we're going to use uh, cosine similarity. So that's a bit of ugly math, but uh, don't worry about that. We're going to see that translated into code in a second. So in order to build this, we're going to first start off with finding um, people and the movies that they both watched. And we're going to have a vector be created from these uh, type of queries. So we'll take here Michael Sherman and Michael Hunger. And so they've rated the same movies. And so we get a list of movies. And we see Sherman hated first dump. Michael Hunger loved it. Um, Sherman hated the Gladiator, and Michael Hunger didn't really like it much either. But um, Michael Sherman loved social network, and Michael Hunger gave it a rating of five. So you can see some similarities, some differences. In And so on. And then we'll do a little math at the bottom. Right? So here we're multiplying and adding and doing the, the square of the square root. In order to get some final number, here is 86%. So we can say that Michael Sherman and Michael Hunger have an 86% similarity uh, for the movies that they both like. Okay. So let's turn that into code. So we're going to find all the people that have rated uh, similar movies. We're going to take the ratings as this dot product, and we're going to do this uh, collecting of the ratings as we go along. We're going to square root, square it, and we're going to take the square root of it, and then at the end, we're going to do a little division. So that looks pretty ugly, but it's just that math translated into code, nothing too crazy. And luckily for us, uh, our data scientist, Nicole White, kind of already did this for us, so I didn't have to even think about it. I can just borrow her code and make it work. So what this is going to give us is for every two people in the, in a graph that have seen any similar movie, we're going to have a similarity score. And that's going to update our model. What that's going to produce is this new relationship between people with some kind of score. So username X and username Y have some similarity between them. And this will be a, a one-direction relationship. So um, username Y is as similar to X as X is to Y. So there's no two relationships, it's just one. I would just um, traverse it from both ends uh, equally. So now what we can do with this? Well, we can find people who are most similar to us. So let's see in the graph who are the top five people who are similar to Grace Andrews, and we'll score them by that similarity score. And we run this query, we're going to get something that looks like this, and we say, okay, so uh, she and Toby are 99% equal, so they're practically clones of each other as far as movie taste. And then we see some others, Wes and Nigel, 97%, and myself, and all the people going on the list. Okay, so that makes sense. This is a way to find people who have very similar tastes to me. And I may want that in general as a part of my recommendation uh, query for my application. But let's use that to build an actual movie recommendation. So here's our canon recommendation. So once again, we're going to find the top 25 movies that a user has not seen yet, but we're going to take the average rating of the top three neighbors and use that as a recommendation. So we'll start with the movie, um, and we'll find people who are similar to Zoltan, where Zoltan has not seen uh, other movies that these people have seen. And we're going to do and collect the top three. So there's that... Um, collect rating 0.3 as ratings. This is getting the top three neighbors. And then it's going to um, add up their ratings and score them, do a little division, and that's our recommendation result for those queries. So nothing too crazy. Once again, it's you know eight or nine lines of code in Cypher, but we did a little bit of the work ahead of time by creating that similarity score between all the people in the graph. And obviously, you don't want to do this similarity scoring real time. You'd want to do this once an hour, once a day, whenever it makes sense. Um, 
it's not going to be exact, it's not going to be perfect, but it doesn't really have to be, right? Uh, someone who is 97% as likely as you, if it changes a little bit and it's now 96.9 or 97.3, uh, it doesn't make any difference. Um, it will still be about right one way or the other. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So why do we want to do this? You know, why do we want to do recommendations over searching or browsing? Well, the reality is we have all of this data from users. They're giving us you know, everything that they like, all of their friends, um, everywhere they've been, you know, what um, kind of food they eat. We have all of this information about users, and instead of asking them to search and search and search, we should just tell them, hey, we know you. You know, we thank you for giving us all this data. Now we're going to make some uh, something useful with it, and we're going to give you this recommendation based on what we know. Let's take a look at some other examples. Um, example, job seekers. Right? A lot of job sites, they ask you to upload their resume. So you upload your resume to them. And then they say, okay, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Now we'll make it easy for you to apply to jobs. But you still have to search for a job. Hmm, that's kind of silly. Let's try to build something a little bit better. So we'll take a user, and we'll take jobs, and we'll try to connect them in the graph. Right now, the jobs and the person don't speak the same language. Right? A resume and a job posting aren't directly connected in any way, uh, which seems like there's an error there. But what we can do in the graph is we can extract things out of both and then use them to connect them together. So if a person lives in California in a particular city, we can extract that information out and connect that person to that node representing uh, a city or a state. And if a job is in that location, then we can do exactly the same thing. A user has some degrees, has some, um, you know, uh, some skills, has some certificates, has some experience, some things that we know, uh, or that they've told us rather, and on their resume they, uh, you know, they've gone through in, in their life experience. We can extract those out as well and save them as notes and connect the user to them. And then the job opening on the other side can say, well, I want someone who's got a four-year degree in mechanical engineering, who has this skill or that skill, who has this certificate or that certificate. Uh, and then we can use those things now to connect them together, let them speak the same language. So what does this query look like? OK, a little bit more complicated than the ones we've seen, but nothing too crazy. So we have a user. Here's uh, Max MRZ logged in. And he lives in a particular location. OK, so I live in Chicago. And I have some skills. So we have some skill nodes on the right. Now, I'm calling them skills, but they could be anything. It could be, you know, certificates, degrees, anything. It's just anything connected to the user through a has relationship. Now, in that location, there's jobs. Because usually you want jobs that are close to home. Um, a lot of folks don't do the telecommuting thing. Uh, I do, which is great, but most folks don't. Uh, all right, so we'll find jobs in the same location as our user, and those jobs have some requirements. Now, what's interesting here, though, is the skills nodes and the requirement nodes are actually the same. And the way we can connect the two together, we can say, okay, where the user, me, has some things that are required by this job. So this tells us that there's going to be at least, at least one connection between the user and the job. Because I, I as a software developer, would make a terrible barista or a terrible cook you know, but I'd be great at doing web development. So we want to be able to just connect them only to, to jobs that are, make sense for them. So we'll take the location, we'll take the job, and then we'll do a few more things here. We're going to collect all the matching skills, and we're going to collect all the requirements uh, of the job, uh, and we're going to grab all those skill names. And then we're going to do something interesting in the filter clause. And the filter clause is saying, find the skills that the job requires that the user does not have uh, and show them to me as missing. And then do a little division, do an order by, and get a result by descending order. So why are we doing this? Well, what we want to provide the user is an interface that looks a little bit like this. Where we have Daniel who lives in Dallas. And we say to Daniel, Daniel, you're 100% match for the first job. You're not missing anything. The second job, you're missing CSS. Well, Daniel looks and says, well, because I didn't put CSS in my resume, but everybody knows CSS. I can just click the plus button, and add that to my profile, and now I'm 100% match for the second job as well. And then it gets to the third job, and it's like, oh, I'm missing Java. That's a little bit harder. Um, 
So what you can do is you can click the plus button lie and try to get you know through that interview somehow, um, or use a time machine to learn Java in 21 days type thing. Uh, so you'll never get rid of the uh, lying problem, but at least you can show a user what jobs they're qualified for, and which jobs they're almost qualified for, and which jobs are you know they're so far unqualified for they shouldn't even apply. And you can also look at this from the other side. If you're a recruiter looking for candidates, you'll be, you'll be able to see, okay, who are the candidates that have 100% match to my requirements, and which candidates have, you know, are missing a couple of things, and maybe it's, oh, that's not really important, or this one's not super great, I don't need it. Um, but this, this person's missing one thing, but it's critical, so I'm going to skip them. So you can look at it from, from both angles, right, from the job angle or from the, uh, the user angle. Now, I actually built this at um, a local recruiting company, but this recommendation engine had a fatal flaw in it, and that is that job boards uh, don't get paid if you actually find the job. They only get paid by the number of applicants they can give to a job posting, because in the end, they're in the business of um, selling resumes, selling data. They're not in the business of actually finding people jobs. Um, so that project was unfortunately scrapped because this thing was going to find people the perfect job right away and then you'll never see them or hear from them again, which is not uh, how you make money in the uh, recruitment space um, or job boards anyway. Okay, so that was jobs. Let's apply something else. Let's try looking at love. Right? You're looking for your soulmate uh, in the graph so and you have a list of requirements for them. You know, You want them to be energetic, Maybe they, you want them to like cats, or maybe like dogs. You want them to have a good sense of humor. Um, you know, neat and tidy, but not crazy about it. You know, anything you want can be a requirement, and people have these crazy lists of all things that they want in a potential mate. Um, and then you have to match, you know, the other person's list. So we're going to look at recommendation engine or query rather to find the top ten potential mates that are in the same location, because maybe your soulmate, you know, is in China and you live in India and you just never see each other. You know, you have two billion people to deal with, you'll find someone close enough. You, know. you want someone who is sexually compatible, otherwise that's going to be a strange relationship. And you have traits that I want and one traits that I have, right? It, love is, has to come from both ends, otherwise uh, it doesn't really work. So let's take a look at this square. A little bit crazier than before, but still, still a similar idea. So we start with a user in a graph. Here's Max. He's logged on. And we say, okay, Max lives in this particular city. And it could be city, a state, a region, however big you want to make it, a zip code if you wanted to, to get down to that level. Uh, but we're going to find other people in that same location, in the same city. And we're going to say, okay, these two people have to have the same orientation. And either the orientation is straight, uh, exclusive, or the gender is the same. And obviously, in the real world, this would be a little bit more, more complicated because there's lots of different genders and lots of different orientations, but uh, you have the similar idea here of a way to filter uh, that. Then we have the interesting part. So we have a user who wants things that a person has, and the user has things that this other person wants. So the bad joke I always make here is I want a tall, rich, blonde supermodel, and she wants fat, bald, nose neo for j which doesn't ever exist in the real world. But that's what we're looking for. Um, so we have this circular match query in the middle of our cipher statement that says the user wants some attributes that this person has, and this person wants some requirements that the user me has. So we have me at the end and me at the beginning, where we're creating a circle as we are connecting the user both through their wants relationship and the has relationship uh, to each other. <coughs> Excuse me. So now what we can do is we can collect all of the interests, and we're going to do a little division at the end. Um, and the division, we order by descending order, because what we want to do is we want to provide the user an interface that looks very similar to our job recommendation. So here we have Lovania, and she matched four people in Philadelphia. And they matched over a humorous and thoughtful or things like likable on the other end. And these are just random adjectives, but they could be anything at all. One of the other things we can do is we can connect our data to other places. 
what we call the semantic web, which has a lot more information that we can pull from the things we know about a user. One example we see a lot is um, using things like uh, Yego or ConceptNet. So these are knowledge bases. And what they do is they take the things that a computer understands about the world and let you have access to it. So things like the concept of sushi. It knows that sushi is from Japan, that is mostly made of raw fish, you know, that is delicious. <coughs> we can ask, okay, what else is delicious? Well, things like cake, you know, and cheese, these things are also delicious. Although people could lie and say things like marmite are delicious as well, which is absolutely disgusting. But these are concepts that the computer knows something about. And you can kind of tie them together. And you can also do things like tie in DBpedia. And there's actually a couple of importers to grab that data and put it into Neo4j. So DBpedia and Wikipedia data. Okay. And what they allow you to do is better connect things. So let's say you have a blob of text that describes your user. You take that blob of text and you pass it to Alchemy or Text Razor or any kind of um, named entity reconnection system. What it's going to bring you back is people, places, things, organizations, things that it knows about based on that blog of text. So if someone says they like Roger Federer, you know Roger Federer is connected to tennis. Tennis is connected to sports. Sports is connected to activities. So you know something about the user. So you can sell them a racket that is signed by Roger Federer or tennis gear or sports gear. <clears throat> or anything along those lines. By knowing just a little bit about a user, you can um, go beyond just a simple level of the things they like to the next level and the next level and kind of expand and try to connect those things to an actual product or item or service that you, that you are selling. Um, for example, we can take Hacker News and we can look at all the um, stories and the blog posts that they're putting on there, we can see what they're all about and who posted the story and who commented on the story. And what we can do with that is we can um, first use Legolia to kind of grab that data. So who the authors were, who the commenters were, the stories and the actual users. We're going to create a model that looks like this. So we have a person X who authored a story. The story was about something. Um, and these are topics, right? Yeah, and these topics are really entries in DBpedia and Wikipedia. And in Wikipedia and DBpedia, what's nice is things are linked. So all these articles, they're not just standalone, they're linked to, to other articles about similar things or things that are related to it. And ultimately, they kind of tie into some category. But what we can do, we can say, okay, well, if a person is writing a lot of stories about this topic or that topic, then we can find people uh, who you know, who also follow that story or follow those topics and tie them together. People who may comment on those stories are also interested in those topics. So we can use that as well to kind of build a recommendation of other people who may be interested in that same topic. And now this is ask questions like, what stories should I read? What users should I follow? You know, who else is probably interested in X, Y, or Z? And who seems to know a lot about X, Y, or Z as a way to you know, build something more useful than what's currently there, which is just a blob of text. Uh, right now, Hacking News doesn't have any social component to it. It doesn't have any way to really track a person and what they've done unless you just click on their username. And it doesn't have any idea of uh, tags or topics. But sometimes those could be added as a way to filter that information out and give you a better interface to that, all that data that's being posted. So. You can try to build this stuff on your own, but there's a couple of frameworks out there that kind of help out. Uh, one of them is built by one of our partners, GraphAware, and it has a lot of nice stuff built into it. Some of it, it lets you pre-compute in the background, um, and then you can kind of use it real time as you queries come in. Uh, so you can try to like it right on your own. The software itself is not very complicated, or you can look at some of the stuff that's out there. Um, there's also Rico4j, I believe, another recommendation engine built using Neo4j, and a few others. And really, this stuff is not super complicated, but 
if you want to look at some example code, if you want to get a, a head start, just be one way to do it. So these are a list of our customers who are using neo 4 j for real-time recommendations for all kinds of things, um, including things like love, products, jobs, um, stories or content to show users, also routing as a way to recommend uh, the fastest way to get from point A to point B, or the best way, rather. And we can go through some of the, the business cases, but some of these are pretty obvious. Right? Um, these are serving uh, product recommendations to customers based on the things that they know about them. And we also have um, other customers like, uh, well, we won't name them here, but it's a global curve uh, who's looking for recommended routes. So the recommendation engine is not a product or, or a movie type recommendation. It's more about what's the best way to get from point A to point B with a recommendation query, which is really just a um, similar idea. You know, someone talked to about them. Um, all the places are like eBay. Um, once again, um, similar idea of finding uh, optimal routes, optimal things uh, in order to get stuff from point A to point B. I'll keep going. Uh, we have classmates. These guys are basically an online yearbook. So looking for people that you may know in the graph, uh, yearbooks where your friends may appear in because you have friends who will switch from one school to another, uh, finding pictures of those people, uh, that kind of stuff. Interesting, interesting use case there. Uh, National Geographic is more about content. So you have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, and there's so much content being produced by everyone that you kind of get um, overloaded. So it would be nice to be able to understand, okay, this particular user is interested in these stories, um, you know, about natural science, maybe, or maybe archaeology is, is their thing that they care about. I'm not going to show them stuff about things that they don't, you know, have no interest in. Uh, I'm just going to try to filter the, the site into just the things that they care about. If you think about a place like Amazon, uh, they sell you everything, uh, which is too much. You know, it'd be nicer to be able to log on to Amazon and say, hey, we know about this particular user. I'm going to not give you everything. I'm just going to filter it and show you the things that you might actually like. If you're not inter interested in fancy clothes, I'm not going to show you those. If you're not interested in, in buying hardware tools, I'm not going to show you those. I'm just going to uh, show you the stuff that I think you'll actually buy instead of just giving you everything and letting you search, which is what they currently do today. <coughs> Um, and there's others, so I'm not going to be crazy going through some of these, but uh, recommendation engines are kind of our bread and butter. We have tons of these solutions out there um, of people using it for these kind of things, looking to recommend other people, other content, said the jobs or, or, uh, or love or anything where you're trying to tie two things together. Um, and these two things usually don't speak the same language in the systems that you currently have, but you can make them speak the same language by extracting things you know about them and using those as the glue uh, to your recommendation engine to, to put it together. 